chapter 8 of Matthew and beginning in verse 18, we'll go to the end of the chapter, which is verse 34. The cost of, uh, of following. I, I don't have enough to do in my life, so one of the things that I also do is uh, help out with the, uh, the parents club here uh, of the kids that are at the Air Force Academy, and, and we're just kind of entering the time when the kids that have gotten their congressional appointments, they're going up to the academy for orientation. One of the kids just went this last weekend. We've been talking with his mom a bit, who, uh, is, uh, as most moms, has a lot of concerns. And, um, and then uh, one of the things that happens is then when they go up at the end of June, if you uh, go up there with them, it's not necessary, but if you go with them, you, uh, you actually uh, have an area that's been established in the lower portion of the campus, which is like 18,000 acres. It's incredibly beautiful and just very, very pristine and, uh, and super well maintained. And, and uh, you know, you're thinking this all looks great. The kids are realizing they're, they're entering prison for four years, you know, but they get a couple of paroles along the way. And they, they have a little inkling of what's ahead of them, but, but a lot of them aren't really sure. And, and you do the... You can t actually kind of say goodbye to them, and then they go through this uh, two-story building and grab all their forms and this and that and sign this and sign that, basically saying that if you hurt and injure them, they, <laughs> it's okay. And then they uh, come out the other side, and there's one place for the, they call it the kiss goodbye area, and that's the last time you, you see them, and then they, they kind of uh, uh, head off, and uh, it's, it's kind of not a good place to be because the it's, it's pretty tough because the dads are crying more than the moms. And, uh, and then they finally uh, uh, head out and they, they go through a couple of quick orientations. And, and then they sweep back by you and you can stand from a distance and watch them board the yellow buses. And then once the, they board these buses and they take them to the, uh, the upper campus uh, where they'll begin uh, basic training. When, when Josh went uh, uh, three years ago, uh, and I just was more familiar with, uh, with the statistics there. Uh, but uh, again, there's, uh, there's thousands of uh, inquiries. There's about 1,600 congressional offers for appointments that go out, about 13 that are accepted. Uh, in his case, average grade point average, 3.9. That's the average. The yeah, average SAT score at that time has been readjusted because they've added uh, additional information on the uh, SATs where the average was, was 1,300. Uh, these kids are the cream of the crop. Most of uh, a large percent of, percentage of them are class uh, uh, presidents, valedictorian, so on and so forth. And it goes on and on. Uh, they don't have to just be smart. They have to be athletic. A large percent of them played varsity sports, about 75 or 80 percent of the campus, which makes intramurals fairly competitive then, and uh, which they're required to play and take seven classes and a few more things that you don't have to do at normal schools. But, um, as they, but it's a big deal to get the appointment, to accept it, to go. Those, again, when they get on the bus and wave goodbye, at that point, and if you've been to basic training, if you're in the military, you know kind of what happens then is you begin to be screamed and yelled at and, and notified that you will set up straight. Your eyes will be forward. You will only respond in seven particular ways, and then they name them off and so forth, and, and you realize that life is going to be different at this point. Uh, it, from the time the bus went to the top, and there's buses, this, this process goes all day because there's like 1,300 kids. And uh, they drop them off at the other upper campus. The bus sweeps back and it repeats the process. That day, 14 kids never got off the bus. I mean, just from being screamed at on the way up there, that was enough. They turned around and, and came back. We would say they did not count the cost uh, that was just the bus ride up, 
up the hill. There's about 100 that drop out uh, during, during basic training and another 100 that drop out during the first two years. They start with about 1,300 and graduate typically about 950 or 980. It's because they didn't really count the cost, as Josh would say. What were they thinking? <laughs> Where did they really think they were going to school? And we meet with parents and kids during this time period I do and try to give them a little glimpse, you know, of what's coming to prepare them a little bit so they can count the cost. Uh, that's what Jesus is doing in this section here. There's a couple of uh, guys that come to him that say, I'll follow you wherever you go. He gives them a couple of little questions, sets the bar very low, minimal, and they walk away. Uh, he's trying to get us to see that if we are going to commit our lives to Jesus Christ, receive salvation that's by faith and grace alone. It means that we're willing to then follow Jesus wherever he may lead. Kind of the classic Amos passage, Amos 4.4, how can two walk together unless they agree to do so? Well, guess what? When you walk with Jesus, he's calling the shots. It's not walk with Jesus and say, Jesus, I'd like to go over here now. I'd like to do this. This is my future. This is No, it's you just walk with Jesus wherever he goes. And if we don't really understand his expectation of us, we're going to be disappointed along the way. And we'll see that uh, in our text. Again, Matthew is teaching us in a very Hebraic way. He's got three sets of threes in terms of miracles and encounters. We saw the first three last week with the outcast, the leper, uh, the officer, the centurion, and then with the, uh, uh, the healing of a woman, in this case, uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law, and again, the overwhelming crowd that Jesus faced after that, but ministered to uh, every one of them. Uh, there'll be a contrast between the great faith of the centurion Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel with what we're going to see within his own disciples here. Verse 18 to 23, first point is Jesus states the cost of following him by faith. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. So first we note there's, uh, there's no promise of personal comfort in following uh, Jesus. Uh, though purported by some false teachers in, in the Western world uh, anyway. But uh, that's certainly not a, a biblical view of Christianity. Teacher of the law, that means he's a scribe. It means he is closely associated with the Pharisees. There's about uh, 120 of these guys that are, or at least references to scribes in, in the New Testament. They were the, the scribes, the teachers uh, of, the, of the word of God in their day. And a couple of things about this guy is that he comes to Jesus and refers to him as the teacher, uh, which was... Um, saying something considering his social uh, as well as educational uh, position. There's there a very, very brilliant guys. They were the scholars uh, of, their, of their day. It'd be like somebody being a Harvard grad and then calling somebody else uh, a rural uh, uh, teacher in a little school somewhere in the countryside, calling him teacher. So there's a certain amount of, of humility here uh, that we need to see uh, in this guy's life. And then his statement that says, I will follow you wherever you go. And that's quite a, quite a statement as well. This, this sounds like a great candidate for a disciple of Jesus Christ. This guy is a scholar. He's probably well known. He's obviously, by his statement, incredibly committed to Jesus Christ. <laughs> but Jesus says something kind of shocking to him. But he says a familiar statement, typical rabbinical statement, common phrase of the day. Foxes have holes, birds have nests. I have no place to lay my head. Uh, now, Jesus uses that common phrase and inserts, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Son of man is a, uh, is a messianic term. It's from the book of Daniel. It's a term that Jesus used of himself most often choosing a rabbinical term, but one with a sense of humility, uh, the son of man. Uh, you can come follow me. You'll go wherever I go. Let me ask you a question. It, are you willing to be homeless? Did I mention that I'm homeless? I don't even know where I'm sleeping tonight. 
Uh, it, it, what's interesting is that's enough for this guy to walk away. He, he, he didn't even mention the suffering, persecution, maybe dying. I mean, he, he really sets the bar pretty low for this guy. And yet the, we don't really hear from the guy uh, anymore. Again, if we have the wrong expectations of our relationship with Jesus Christ and what it will be like here on earth. Again, God does promises, uh, uh, you know, a home in heaven, but uh, there's also the reality that life can be difficult uh, here on earth. And, uh, and some of this would have been a, a real shock. Uh, the implication becoming a disciple means we must trust Jesus for the future. Uh, in other words, when I decide to walk with him, my future is in his hands. I'm thankful that I'm saved. I'm thankful that uh, he's forgiven me of all of my sins. I realize that uh, he is the, the God of all creation. He can do anything he wants to do. And he's, he'll, he'll never leave me and protect and, or forsake me in any way and so forth. But, uh, but sometimes we want all of that, but we want it on our own terms. And that's, that's what this guy wanted here. And Jesus said, no, <laughs> there's a cost. Will you trust me with your future, where I might lead, where I might take you? There's um, a a little quote by John MacArthur I wanted to read. Uh, He says that Jesus knew the scribe was too eager to declare his allegiance. He did not count the cost of discipleship, which involves self-denial, sacrifice, quite possibly suffering. Jesus' proverb about foxes and birds represented the relatively minimal sacrifice of being homeless, yet... That cost was obviously too high because the scribe simply disappears without another word said by or uh, about him. So again, no promise of personal comfort in following Jesus. Secondly, no promise of personal benefit in following him. We see that from uh, the second uh, individual. Now this comes across as pretty uh, pretty harsh when uh, uh, Jesus says, yeah, come follow me and He's willing, and, but he says, well, let me first go bury my father. And then Jesus says, well, let the dead bury the dead. It's like, wow, that's kind of harsh. Yeah, but uh, you have to understand what this guy is saying. This is a, a term that is still used in the Middle East today. Oh, let me first go bury my father. Hey, can you meet us here next week in such and such a city? And I, oh, let me first go. What the guy's saying is that let me first go back and continue in my father's business and caring for his business. He's not dead. And he may not be dead for the next 30 years. Let me care for his business for the next 10 years, 20 years, maybe 30 years. And then when he dies and I collect my inheritance and it's all divided up, then I'll come follow you. So I'll follow you wherever you want to go. Oh, let me, <laughs> this is, it's so classic uh, 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 Middle East. It's, uh, it's kind of comical to us, just over the top politeness, very speaking, very indirectly. Uh, but uh, Jesus basically, that's why he says kind of a shocking statement. It's meant to be shocking. He's not trying to draw some parallel between spiritual living and physical living or anything. He's just trying to, for hyperbole, for shocking sake, very Hebraic, he's just saying, let the dead bury the dead. You come follow me. In um, Luke's gospel, we know that he also said, and proclaim the gospel. There's a contrast between your life and what you want to do and what you think is important now. You think the security of your future, your fortune, uh, and, uh, and so forth is more important than actually the kingdom of God. But if you're going to follow me, you have to have a different set of priorities. The planning of the future, the priorities that you lay out, all of those things have to be submitted to me. It's interesting, the word disciple simply means a follower. And that's what Jesus is saying. Just follow me. What if I don't like where you're going? It doesn't matter. Just follow me. <laughs> what if I don't like the circumstances? Did I mention we're going for a boat ride here? <laughs> and of course, they don't know there's a little storm coming. You know, It's funny because we, we laugh about uh, Peter, James, and John and, and all the other guys because it's like they're, they're not a lot better. You know, they're following Jesus, but as we'll see, uh, it's not like they got it all together. I, I think they're just dumber or something. You know what I mean? They just haven't really thought it through. I mean, I don't know that they've really counted the cost either, uh, as, as we'll see in some of the remarks and some of the things that they say, but at least they're just willing. They're, they're just kind of, uh, you know... Uh, uh, checked out. Oh, we'll just follow Jesus. It's all good, you know, and they're, they're going to go with him anyway. And you know, the God is so gracious. He goes, come on guys, you know, I'll, we'll, I'll just kind of work with you as we go along here, uh, as we'll see in a, in a moment. But uh, these first two guys, 
uh, really had wrong priorities and, uh, and not really seen uh, what Jesus was saying in terms of come follow me. There's a real classic example of somebody that did understand in Acts chapter 8, and that's Philip. Remember, remember Philip is just a young guy that's just serving in the early church, literally just serving uh, and so forth. And he's one of the guys that uh, when they, they have a little division between the Hellenistic Jews and, and the Jews that are right there from uh, Jerusalem and so forth, a little conflict there because their backgrounds. Uh, and, uh, and these feel like uh, uh, we're being discriminated against in terms of caring for the poor and the widows and so forth. So they said, great, we'll just select some guys. And they, they list qualifications, men full of the Holy Spirit and so forth. And Philip's one of those guys. Later we see Philip, he goes to, in Acts 8, he goes to Samaria and goes up there and really is the first guy to go to, to non-Jews with, uh, with, the, with the gospel. Uh, they're very receptive. There's a great revival that breaks out in Samaria. People are uh, being saved. There's uh, uh, miraculous things going on. Uh, it's causing such a stir that they send Peter and John up there just to see what's going on. But uh, tremendous things going on. And, uh, and Philip, in the midst of that, then Jesus says, I want you to leave all of this the success of all of this, the blessings of all this, I want you to go stand down in the desert. He really didn't give him a whole lot of instructions. I just, I want you down to the Gaza Strip area. Well, if Peter had never, or excuse me, Philip had never counted the cost, then he wouldn't go. I mean, <laughs> would you go from there where God's moving and, and uh, these uh, wonderful things are taking place and then just go uh, down to the desert and hope that somebody might come by that you could minister to. Well, Philip understands the cost of discipleship. Jesus says, go to the desert. No hesitation. He just goes to the desert. And you know the story. He's standing down there and comes a BMW and a guy, well, it's a chariot. But this guy is uh, an official from Ethiopia. I'm sure it was a BMW chariot. And he jumps out and it was even a convertible. I'm pretty sure of that. And he uh, jumps out and... And then he's got the scroll of Isaiah. You know the story. He leads him to the Lord. He baptizes him. And then that guy goes uh, down to North Africa where the church uh, spreads and prospers. And there's remnants of that church. We refer to them as the Coptic Christians there in North Africa where they're persecuted to, uh, to this day. But Philip understood the cost of discipleship. So when Jesus says, leave this environment, go to a, a harsher, worse one, it was just, sure, Lord, wherever you're, you're leading. So Jesus states the cost of following him by faith. And secondly, Jesus calms a storm uh, and our fears, because there's going to be both at times when we follow him. Verse 24 to 27 says, Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So first we know that the storm threatened the lives of, of the disciples. Uh, it says that the waves swept over the boat. The term for uh, storm uh, is uh, uh, a Greek term, seismos, where we get our word seismic, like an earthquake. Uh, in um, Mark's uh, parallel account, it says a furious squall came up, and that word squall is uh, similar to the idea of hurricane. You have earthquake-like uh, things happen in the water. You've got a hurricane-like forces there on the Sea of Galilee, and say, man, this must be some sea, you know. Uh, again, it is. It's just the way it's, uh, it's um, uh, located. It's below sea level. Uh, but uh, surrounded by high mountains. Uh, it's in a place in the country where you've got warm weather and cold weather converging, uh, occasionally causing these dramatic storms, which they, uh, they do to, uh, to this day. This seems to be much more radical. These guys, for the most part, are professional fishermen, but as far as they're concerned, they're going to drown. Uh, waves are breaking over the boats. It's, uh, uh, we actually showed you a picture of of a replica of the boat when we started uh, with our, our uh, teaching of this gospel. And so it's open deck. So they're, uh, they're on their knees bailing when they should have been on their knees bailing and praying, you know, at the, at the same time. I'm not saying you shouldn't bail in those times, but uh, they should have been praying uh, and they weren't. Jesus un undoubtedly knew that the storm was coming. He certainly could have prevented it, uh, but he doesn't. And it's because he's trying to teach 
his disciples, the ones that did get in the boat, uh, a lesson about trusting him with their future and with their priorities. And again, Mark's gospel tells us that uh, it's all the boys are there. And there's, there's actually a couple of fishing boats and so forth. And so they're all of the, what we would f- refer to as the 12 are, are there at this point. Uh, and they say, Lord, save us. Uh, we're going to, to drown. And certainly at that point, they figured they had no alternative other than to turn to Jesus. <laughs> and sometimes that, unfortunately, that's where we're at as well. These are all the disciples. These are the ones that did get in the boat to some degree, have counted the cost and so forth. Uh, and when faced with a life-threatening situation with tremendous difficulty, which for us could be a sickness, an illness, a loss of job, whatever it might be. We have different things that we could label the storms of life. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we wait to the end when there's nothing else we can do. Then we cry out to the Lord and, and ask him to save us. And uh, uh, a couple of things about this that are, uh, that are interesting, and, and that is that uh, the danger that they were facing, the great danger they were facing was their lack of faith. It wasn't the storm. Jesus is in the boat. I mean, he, uh, again, in, in another gospel, he had said, let us go over. And uh, just not to make a pun out of it, but if Jesus said, we're going over, you're going over, you're not going to go under. They're not going to go down. It wasn't going to happen. You can tell he's real concerned about it. He's sleeping in, uh, in, this, in the uh, stern of the boat there on a cushion, uh, obviously showing us the incredible fatigue uh, that he had from the, the previous day uh, and uh, in evening and all that he had uh, been through and so forth. At this point, exhausted, showing his humanity, but at the same time, uh, in total peace uh, in the midst of the storm. Their concern uh, for them, Jesus' concern from his perspective, was their, their lack of faith. His concern was not how big the waves were, how big the storm were, what's going to happen to the boat. And so secondly, we certainly could say the storm tested the faith of the disciples. And uh, again, let me read from Mark's uh, gospel, Mark 4.38. Uh, an interesting note there. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? That was kind of a, uh, I wonder if that hurt. I mean, these are the guys that Jesus chose, brought to himself, accepted. They're living with him day and night. That was part of the whole, whole thing and following him and an official call to follow him as a rabbi. They're, they're with him day and night. He's serving them. They see him doing all the miraculous things, this compassion, uh, the gracious way he deals with them when they're arguing with each other and, and so forth. Now they're in this boat. This thing is going on. And the first thing they say is certainly, that's fine. Jesus, help us, save us. But to say, don't you care about us? Now, I know that none of us would ever say that when faced with life difficulty or an illness or a death in the family or whatever. But again, I think we can relate a little bit and I think we can understand why we shouldn't be saying this. I mean, away from the circumstances, it's easy to have tremendous faith in what the Lord's doing when things are going well. Uh, The real test is when things are, are not going well. Uh, and yet the Lord allows it so that we might uh, develop in our, in our faith and learn to trust him in, uh, in greater ways. So Jesus rebukes them for their little faith. And in fact, in Mark, he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? None. Uh, see, that was the real issue. And that's why Jesus allows them to come into the circumstance. And I think sometimes... Uh, it could be the said uh, the same of us. Uh, one one uh, expression of faith is, uh, I, I think, a good one. Faith is believing in spite of circumstances. Regardless of the circumstances, you believe. But I think this is a better one. Faith is obeying in spite of feelings and consequences. Uh, in spite of what I'm feeling right now, and in spite of my consequences, I choose to trust the Lord anyway. Now, I want to read you a couple of statements, and one is from Psalm 107, and it's lengthy, so I don't have it for you on a slide. If you want to read along, uh, we're going to look at Psalm 107, verse, starting in verse 23. Now, because they, these guys are familiar with the Bible. I mean, they are, are much more familiar with it than, than we are in terms of memorization and study and so forth. It was just something they did every day since they were kids. They were, it was part of their lives. And they certainly, there was lots of passages that deal with this idea of God coming and calming the storms and being with you in the midst of it and so forth. 
And this is kind of a classic one. Others went out on the, uh, on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths in the peril. Their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits' end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. I wonder if that passage was ringing through in their ears, coming to their minds in the midst of it. Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, and I think it's critical that in those times when we're really being stretched, when we're really being tested, when we're being tempted to really say, Lord, don't you care about us? Boy, that's a good time to bring the word of God back to your mind. That's a good, you know, even if it's not memorized, you know, that's why we're going through the Psalms. It's like a, it's preparation for the storm, you know, because they're, they're full of words of comfort. And I'm kind of telling you, mark this one, mark this one, mark this section to this section. It's a place to go back to when you're, you're going through the storms of life and the waves are breaking over the bow of the boat. It sure seems like God is asleep <laughs> in all of this. And I'm tempted to say, don't you care about me? Ah, if they had a thought about this Psalm, they could have just cried out, prayed out. I think God would have answered their prayers and calmed the storm right there. Again, Jesus was with them all the way. There was just no acknowledgement of his power, his person, his care, his love, and what he would be willing to do for them if they simply cried out and exercised their faith. Classic hymn by uh, uh, Isaac Watts is the other thing I wanted to uh, read to you. A uh, little, little King James here. We sing the mighty power of God who bade the mountains rise, who spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. We sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed when e'er we turn our eyes, we e'er we view the ground we tread or gaze upon the skies. There's not a plant nor flower below, but makes thy glories known and clouds arise and tempests blow by order of thy throne. So God's in all of creation. It's very easy to see. See his beauty, his majesty, his power. And then he closes with these lines. On thee each moment we depend. If thou withdraw, we die. Oh, may we never, God, offend who is forever nigh. May we never offend you, Lord, because you're right here with us. Is what Isaac Watts is saying. It's obvious. We can look around. We can declare his glory, his beauty, his majesty, be in awe of it. But uh, may we not offend God to say somehow he's not here with us uh, in the midst of our difficulty and uh, in our trouble. Those guys, I don't think when the waves were breaking up and over the bow, praise the Lord, look at that baby. That's beautiful. I wonder how big that is. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, they weren't exactly doing that. But, you know, see, in a sense, they could have been. They could have been. Should we, is this too much? Too much? For you? All right, Lord, we ask you to just calm the storm now here. And, uh, and, and just cried out to the Lord, we need some help here. Hey, Jesus, can you wake up? And uh, we know you can take care of this for us. We're, we're a little concerned. We trust you, but we're a little concerned here. Okay, but that's not really how it played out. And, uh, and sometimes it's not with us as well. Imagine the guys that didn't get in the boat, they're concerned. Uh, but th the ones that did still have a failing of faith. A couple of, uh, of what we might say life lessons for us because of this. One is... Confidence in the person and the word of Christ will deliver us from fear and anxiety. And we had a whole study on this a few weeks back again. But, but again, if we really trust God's word and the person of Christ, his character, who he is, it'll deliver us often from fear and anxiety. Secondly, Jesus said in the parable of the sower and the seed that it's worry, again, worry that prevents that plant from maturing. And certainly we'll never mature in the Lord if we don't learn to trust him uh, in these kinds of circumstances. And three, God allows storms to come into our life to develop our faith. Like what Ken Hughes says, he says, storms are God's way of bringing us into deeper grace. Without adversity, 
we would be insufferably self-centered, proud, flat-dimensioned, empty people. And, and we really would. It's, it's these things that really shape us and cause us to, uh, to trust the Lord. So there's a cost of following him by faith. There's a calming of the storm in our fears. And then lastly, Jesus cast out the demons by his power, and that's in verse 28 and 34. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs were feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, reported all of this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their regions. I, I, I always just found that story fascinating and, and, and the reaction at the crowd in the end particular just always kind of uh, baffled my mind. I didn't really understand. And again, until we understand the way that Matthew is trying to teach us topically through the, the life and the teaching and the miracles of Jesus. And now these groupings of threes together, because the emphasis here is at the cost of following Jesus. What, how did they view the cost of following Jesus? It was going to be tremendous. They just lost their whole livelihood. The whole economy, the thing went right down the drain. He only just showed up. He'd only been there a little while. What else is going to be uh, required of us? Uh, uh, this whole thing shows us a, a couple of other things as, as well. First, the power of the demons reveal the plan of Satan. Here's the plan of, of Satan for, for lives. And uh, again, take you to the parallel account in Mark's gospel, uh, Mark 5.3. Uh, talking about uh, the, the demoniacs of Gadara. Uh, this man, uh, and I just want to say in, in Mark and Luke's gospel, they focus on one guy who apparently was a spokesman. There's no contradiction here. Uh, 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 Matthew mentions there too. There might have been more. There might have been many more. We know from one account that Jesus refers to the demons as legion. A legion is 6,000. There's 2,000 pigs we know that end up down the hill. Uh, how many men were out there that were demon possessed? We don't know for sure. We've got two that are being Direct to here. One is a spokesman that we see more details about in Mark 5. This man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons of his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Here's a picture of the plan of Satan for for man. Satan robs, robs us of sanity, of self-control, fills us with fears, robs us of our joy, isolates us from others, and if possible, condemns us to an eternity of, of judgment. That is Satan's plan for uh, every person here on earth. Why? Because uh, as man, we are made in the image of God to glorify God, and Satan hates that. Because he hates God, he hates anything that bears his image, much less that which is living to or potentially could live to glorify God. It's everything that he rejected and he hates mankind. Uh, we're in a warfare here and sometimes uh, uh, we forget about that. Now I like what C.S. Lewis said. He says there's, I'll, I'll paraphrase, he says there's two, two extremes of this and, and Satan loves them both. One of the extreme is to act like there is no demonic entities out there. There is no evil. Uh, there, there are no fallen angels. That's one view. Satan likes that one. And the other one is to become so preoccupied that, that uh, you see a demon behind every rock and every time the door squeak, oh, it must be a demon kind of a thing. And everything is the fault of a demon. I'm paraphrasing, but, but uh, C.S. Lewis says both those extremes are very unhealthy and allow us to be really uh, set up to be uh, to be brought down by, by the enemy. Again, Paul's very explicit to put on the full armor of God because we will be attacked. These guys are possessed, 
believers in Jesus Christ, the presence of God's spirit in us cannot be. Uh, darkness and light, Paul says, cannot dwell together. Uh, the Bible is very clear on that. But it doesn't mean that we cannot be, uh, again, attacked by the enemy, influenced by the enemy. Uh, these kinds of influences to, uh, to rob us of our self-control, to bring fear into our life, to try to isolate us and so forth. Uh, the things that we see here are some of the things that he still tries to do uh, or against believers today. A couple other characteristics. We noticed that the demons were extremely violent. Uh, no one would even pass that way. This guy in particular could not be even bound with, with uh, chains. Uh, when there's lots of violence going on that we read in the news, not always, but a lot of times there is very much a satanic influence behind it. And uh, if you have, ever have an opportunity to hear a, a Christian police chaplain, especially from a large city, speak, somebody like Mike McIntosh, uh, who are allowed at the crime scene very often when these horrific uh, you know, deaths occur, along with it, they find all of the markings of, of somebody that's part of a satanic cult and so forth. That part does not come out in the news, rarely does, uh, but it's there very, very often. There's a tremendous influence by Satan towards violence. Uh, secondly, uh, these demons are, uh, greatly fear Jesus. Uh, they refer to him as the Son of God, the God Most High, and so forth. And uh, there's an acknowledgement, certainly, of, of who he is and his presence and his power. Uh, the demons' uh, desire is to destroy uh, they're destroying the lives of these men. They seek to destroy the lives of people today. Uh, that's uh, either through, uh, again, the extreme of possession uh, as well as uh, what they can do in terms of uh, influence and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then uh, the demons, uh, we could say certainly, this is very interesting, have faith in Jesus. In fact, we can construct uh, a real great uh, system, systematic theology. It's what Warren Worsby calls demonic faith. Uh, 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 note that... Um, that they believe in the existence of God. They believe in the deity of Christ. They believe in a future eternal judgment. They also believe in prayer. They cry out to Jesus with a request. They knew that Jesus had the power to send them into the swine. He could control uh, nature in the, in the environment. That's a lot of faith. Again, James 2.19 says, uh, you believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So apparently, they're even also capable of having a spiritual, emotional experience. Uh, so again, these things alone are not enough to make you a real follower of Jesus Christ. Correct theology is not enough. The demons have pretty, pretty good uh, theology them, themselves. Uh, in fact, in Mark's account, he says, one of them ran up and bowed before Jesus. Now, the term bow is the one that would be normally used for worship, but certainly it's the acknowledgement of who he was and that God was standing before them and they, in, in the possession of this man, got on their face and referred to him as the most high, high God. Uh, again, what we see in the life of this man is not uncommon uh, in those that are uh, possessed. There's attempts to take the life, the violent uh, we know that from the other gospel in Luke's account, they're not wearing any, any clothing any longer. Uh, there it says, for a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in, uh, in the tombs. And we see, a, a, again, a satanic influence over our own culture uh, in the same characteristics in terms of drug abuse, pornography, obscenity, so on and so forth. These things are the direct influence of a spiritual realm that exists and uh, our two concerns is to act, not act like it doesn't exist, nor to go to the extreme where we kind of center our lives around the concern over it. And again, the reason that Satan is interested in attacking mankind, we're created in the image of God. Secondly, the demons reveal the power of Jesus. And uh, I just want to mention a few more things uh, about demons to make sure we understand uh, what we're talking about here. Demons have a superior intelligence, according to Ezekiel 28. They have a superior strength, as we've seen from Mark 5. They have a superior supernatural power to perform signs and wonders, according to 2 Thessalonians. They have a superior experience, because they've existed before the creation of the universe. They were there. They saw God speak the universe into existence. They were holy angels that are now uh, fallen angels. Therefore, they have a great knowledge of God's nature and his power. They also have a great knowledge of man's weakness uh, in his own uh, fallen nature. They understand all of those things. 
they also are not limited to the time-space continuum that we live in. They, again, are spiritual beings. They can step in and out of the time-space continuum. Uh, they are to be feared. We are no match for them, but they are no match for Jesus Christ. Uh, a verse you might want to memorize is 1 John 4.4. 4. <laughs> if you don't get the whole thing, get the second half. You, dear children, are, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Uh, the one who is in you is the Holy Spirit, God himself. The one who is in the world, of course, is a reference to Satan. Again, this allows for his disciples, the ones that did get in the boat, just learned a lesson about faith, to see the power of, of uh, the one who's calling them, saying, come follow me. Uh, Jesus just says the word, go. And that's, that's it. I mean, however many there were, whether they're hundreds or thousands, how many there were, they're gone. Just with all he says is go. Uh, no convincing, no conjoling, no fasting and praying, no, just go. And they're gone and, uh, and into the swine. Uh, again, it's, uh, uh, it's a concern because with the rise of the occult uh, uh, in, in our own country, more in the Western world than we've seen in quite some time, uh, there's certainly a rise in, in, uh, uh, in things that go on in the spiritual dimension. I just have my, my uh, I, I've, I've seen it, I've had to deal with it, and certainly I see it when I go to places like India and so forth, because you have tremendous idol worship going on, uh, people live in tremendous uh, fear and so forth in regards to the oppression of, uh, of the religious state, uh, systems that they are under, uh, like, uh, like Hinduism and, uh, uh, and others, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a common thing there. It's just a common thing. It's not common here because I think Satan realizes that um, uh, if he displayed his power that way, people would be much more aware uh, of, uh, of him and his activity. I think he uh, realizes that in a, uh, in a different kind of a cultural context, uh, he, he's better off being more deceptive. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any other reason why we see it prevailing in some cultural settings uh, a lot more than others, but uh, certainly that is, uh, that is the case. The third thing that we see here, their perspective of people uh, meant Jesus would leave the area, which I mentioned uh, as we began this section. Uh, those tending the, the pigs ran off, reported all that happened in the town. Uh, I don't know what a couple thousand pigs running down a hill and jumping through a lake looks like. I mean, we've been hiking on the big island, and I've seen them six or eight or a dozen at a time, uh, some pretty good size, size ones. And, uh, uh, you know, we were always, uh, you know, picking out the tree we were going to run to if they came our way, you know, kind of, kind of a thing. And, uh, but 2,000, you know, uh, again, these are... Uh, being bred, you know, for, uh, for food and so forth. I don't know if they're real different than the kind we have running around in the, in the woods here. But uh, nonetheless, 2,000 pigs running down a hillside, that's, that's enough to uh, get the town out, you know, when these guys go and report what's happened. And also the fact that uh, these two men uh, mentioned uh, specifically in the other gospel accounts are now sitting at Jesus' feet, uh, fully clothed, in their right mind, and, and so forth. It's both of those things that they, they come out to see. Uh, one of the other uh, kind of uh, begs the question is, did Jesus have the right to destroy the business? Two things to keep in mind. Uh, they're in Israel. Uh, we don't know if this is a Jewish community or not uh, at this point in time, by the time we're in the first century. Uh, certainly was under the rule of Joshua and the judges and so on and so forth. But at this time, we, we don't know for sure. If they were Jewish, then hello, you know, you, you know, they're not even supposed to eat pork, much less raise pigs. If they're not Jewish, if they're Gentile and have moved into that area, it's still Israel. They're still not supposed to be raising pigs there. Uh, I don't really have a problem with Jesus, you know, dispatching here. Uh, of the uh, pig industry there in, uh, in Israel. Uh, but, uh, you know, why the pigs wanted to, uh, the demons wanted to go in them and so forth, we don't really uh, know for sure other than, again, I think they're, they're bent on destruction, whatever or however they might uh, bring it about. The, uh, but again, the response of, of the people here. Uh, now, I want to point out a couple things, and I need to go to Mark's gospel uh, one more time to do that, uh, because there we have the account of them coming back as well. Mark uh, 5.18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, 
The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, the ten cities in that region, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So again, they come out, in a sense, reject Jesus. Uh, but Jesus, uh, you know, from my take on this, doesn't really give up on them. You, re you reject me now? That's okay. And then the, the guys that want to go with them think they've counted the cost? I don't think they care. They're just going to follow him. Uh, actually, that's, that's a pretty good disciple. Man, my life was so ruined, Jesus. I don't care where you're going. You ain't got a home? I was in the tombs before. Let's just go. You know, he who is forgiven much loves much. Uh, that, that's probably, these guys are probably, these are probably pretty good material here. Maybe better than the guys that are in the boat. Uh, maybe that's why he's able to release them a little sooner and says, you know what? These people that just rejected me, you go back to them and just be a witness to them and, and let them know through your life, you know, what, what it is to have a relationship with me and to be my disciple and, and so forth. Jesus doesn't give up on them. He actually sends these guys back. Again, I like that to, to minister into their own home uh, first and then in, in, into the community. Uh, the other thing, uh, again, that to tie this all together, we start with two guys that basically refuse to get in the boat with Jesus because once they start to count the cost, they went, uh, not for me. You know, it's like I might have to give up some comforts, the personal benefits, and maybe a future inheritance, whatever it might be. And obviously, Jesus knew their hearts and knew the issues to try to deal with there, and they refused really to go with him at that point, although. They had the education, they made all the allegiance and so forth. The story ends with two guys saying, yeah, let us in the boat. We don't know anything other than we're like wild men before and, and now we're in our right mind and uh, you've given us a new life. We'll just follow, we'll follow you anywhere. It's, it's quite the, the contrast uh, and then that with the idea of this whole community that witnesses this and yet refuses to even have Jesus be in their area. There's an old uh, poem by a man named John Oxium who, that says uh, about the idea on behalf of the people that rejected Jesus in the community, Rabbi, be gone. Thy powers bring loss to us and ours. Our ways are not as thine. Thou lovest men, we swine. Oh, get you hence, omnipotence, and take this fool of thine. His soul, we, what we care for his soul. What good to us, thou hast made him whole, since we have lost our swine. <laughs> we might say they were being really pig-headed. Sorry, I had to get at least one of those lines uh, in there. But uh, again, the cost of following Jesus, it might cost something. It might cost our future plans, our priorities. But it, uh, in the process, we need to give him our fears and our pig-headedness if we're really going to follow him and be his disciple. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we are gathered together, to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We are gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grave. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifting on your wings, and the In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, 
in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We are gathered together. Lift up your name to call on our Savior to fall on your grave. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is so in your name, morning turns to sun. i 
the truth.